From Baltimore to Ferguson to New York, Wednesday was a major day for criminal justice news. In Baltimore, a mistrial has been declared in the case of one of the police officers charged in the death of Freddie Gray. Gray died in April from a spinal injury sustained while being transported in the back of a police van. Meanwhile, in Ferguson, Missouri, officials say they have reached the outlines of a deal with the Justice Department that would force changes to the city's police department and head off a civil rights lawsuit alleging years of unconstitutional policing. And here in New York, the state has agreed to overhaul the system of solitary confinement in state prisons following a three-year legal battle with the New York Civil Liberties Union. To talk more about these issues, we're joined by Ben Jealous, senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. He's the former NAACP president and CEO. He's joining us from Baltimore. Ben, welcome back to Democracy Now! Let's start where you are in Baltimore. You have this hung jury. You have a mistrial. Twelve jurors, um, I believe eight of them were black, uh, four of them were white, trying a black police officer uh, in the death of Freddie Gray, an African-American resident of Baltimore who lived not far uh, from where William Porter lived. Can you talk the significance of the mistrial, the issue of race and policing in this country? You know, look, the uh, mistrial is in some ways oddly uh, good news. In as much as it means that, that the prosecutor's argument was getting traction with many jurors. Uh, in these t sorts of cases, uh, cops are about half as likely to be con convicted when charged with the same crimes as um, civilians, in this case, murder. And so uh, it does suggest uh, that, the, that, that the prosecutors here were perhaps being more successful than prosecutors are in most places. And the fact is that most of the time, when you go to a second trial, uh, the person is convicted. And so there is reason to be hopeful here that uh, you know, justice will be done for Freddie Gray. And Ben Jealous, you've been uh, working on uh, recommendations for reforming the Baltimore Police Department. Could you talk about what some of the recommendations are that you've been making? Yeah, the first one is that we've got to fire more bad cops. And the second one is, is that we have to stop imposing a gag order on victims of brutality. The bottom line is that we got to increase trust. I mean, we're in a city uh, that has two crises, has twin crises. On the one hand, murders are going up. On the other hand, we've had a sustained spate of horrible police brutality cases. And the reality is that we have to increase trust to, to, to solve more homicides, but we're not going to increase trust until people can trust that the cops will treat them fairly and not beat them up or kill them. So what are some of the recommendations that you make towards that end? Sure, yeah. So first one, we've got to fire more bad cops. Two, we got to get rid of the gag order on victims of, uh, of, of uh, brutality. Um, you know, three, we've got to roll out the body cameras even faster. Uh, we also got to shift, uh, frankly, to, to more of a, um, uh, you know, to, we have to shift the priorities from kind of low-level drug offenses to serious crimes. You know, th those are, I'd say, the four big ones that we've been focused on. And we also, frankly, have a, have a need for just basic transparency. You know, we, we found out this summer that most of the, well, excuse me, many of the precincts were closed after 7 p.m., and the, and the young man who figured that out uh, and exposed it was told because, well, quite frankly, it's dangerous after 7 p.m. Well, that's why we need the precincts open, but people didn't know because here, unfortunately, unlike Los Angeles, we do not publish uh, the practices and the policies of the cops uh, where folks can find them, and we need to start doing that. In the testimony around William Porter, and do you think you're going to find this in the other cases, and the other trials, they defend themselves by criticizing the police department so that you gain more information about how the police department works. No, look, you know, that's, that's right. And, and the reality is that, that the, the department here has a lot of work that needs, needs to be done to, to uh, make it even more effective. We're the 26th largest city. We have the eighth largest uh, d department. Uh, and quite frankly, we, we should be getting more value from it as uh, citizens here. We should feel like you know, they are some of the best prepared and most professional on the planet. And unfortunately, uh, the way in which this, this department has continued to you know, tolerate bad officers and hide their uh, misdeeds um, and, quite frankly, uh, not been as effective as they could be in, in, in getting killers off the streets uh, has left people really wanting more on all sides. 
Well, one of your recommendations, uh, Ben Jealous, is to have uh, police cameras uh, uh, used in the Baltimore Police Department. They already have a pilot program uh, testing that. Right. What's your response to that? Well, we have a pilot program uh, that they're saying is going to take four years to get to, to you know, fully out there, when uh, we've seen uh, similar cities do it in six months. And you know what's what's even more concerning is that they want the cops to have full control of the data rather than for the city to own it, and the city needs to own that data so that it can be used not just in prosecution but also in uh, defense, and quite frankly, so that the city council and the mayor can can, can actually have line of sight into what the officers are doing. Ben, can you talk about what's happening right now in Ferguson, Missouri? What kind of deal has been reached uh, with the authorities and the local police department? Yeah, look, um, you know, this this deal will will provide for uh, more training. It will uh, let um, folks kind of be, I could sort of trust that the federal government's going to stay engaged and going to uh, monitor and and uh, look over the department for some time. There'll be increased transparency. Um, you know, and, and that's a reason for, for hope. I mean, the most important thing in Ferguson is for the activists in the street of Ferguson to, to really stay engaged. Um, you know, this, this simply makes it easier to reform their department. This is not uh, the change, if you will, that they were seeking. It simply creates a better context for making change happen. Well, Benjamin Jealous, you, you've written recently about some of the reforms that were undertaken in the Cincinnati uh, Police Department after officers killed uh, the 19-year-old African-American Timothy Thomas in 2001. Could you talk about what some of those reforms were and how they've impacted uh, policing in Cincinnati? Now, look, you know, I, I can recall going back to Cincinnati um, to uh, actually study the department after the reforms were starting to be made. And, you know, what you see is a city that, that, you know, now has, you know, has begun to move in the right direction. The reality is, I think what you're seeing across the country is the disruptive and powerful force of everybody having a video camera in their pocket. I mean, even the reforms that we were making back in the early 2000s, quite frankly, uh, weren't enough. And, and what we're seeing on, on video, um, you know, from cities across the country, including many in Ohio uh, th these days is is that we 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 need to push to push further further but you know one of the things I mean, things that they started to do there were to you know, get people out of their cars and actually talking to people building relationships being more transparent about policies you know um, uh, frankly being more focused on getting bad cops off the street better training around use of force um, you know and that's you know those are many of the reforms that need to happen but at the same time I think as a country we have to brace ourselves for the reality that that we're going to continue to see more of the worst of what happens in our streets by the people who have sworn to protect and respect us simply because everybody now has a video camera in their pocket the good news is that the sort of transparency and quite frankly shame that that um, uh, uh, makes makes possible uh, will lead to change. You know, light changes things, visibility changes things, and us finally seeing what so many officers uh, have done in the past but were able to deny that they could no longer, uh, frankly, de uh, deny is painful as a country, but it does give us reason to hope that uh, b better days are in front of us. Ben Jealous in Chicago, do you think that the police killing of Laquan McDonald, now the officer uh, now has six first degree murder charges against him, but now there's calls for the mayor to resign. It was all kept hush hush. In fact, Laquan was killed more than a year ago uh, through the mayoral re election. Just yesterday, uh, Mayor Emanuel was uh, at a charter school and the kids started chanting 16 shots, 16 shots. Do you think this could lead to the resignation of uh, Mayor Emanuel? You know, I'm not sure what will happen, and I really hope folks continue to dig to find out what actually happened, because the reality is that the black community played a critical role in putting him back in office. Uh, and, um, and so it would make sense, if you will, that somebody on his team would try to, to, to hide this. We need to know whether it was him, whether it was uh, somebody else. And yes, I think that activists in the, in the city should keep the heat turned up as high as possible until we know what actually happened. Because if, 
if they, in, you know, if the mayor actually intentionally acted to keep this from public view in order to get back in office, then yes, he should, he should, he, he should step down. But until we uh, know that, we need to just keep pushing for the, tr for the full truth to uh, c come out. Well, Ben Jealous, an issue you've been long involved with is the issue of executions in the United States. And a new report shows that executions in this country have dropped to their lowest level in a quarter of a century. Of the 28 executions carried out this year, 13 took place in Texas, six in Missouri, five in Georgia. The Death Penalty Information Center says a total of 49 new death sentences were imposed this year, the lowest number since the early 70s. Can you talk about the significance of this? And if you think we will see the end of the death penalty in the United States, something you, has been, you have been pushing for state by state? Yeah, look, you know, we are, we are close. We can see the end. It will happen, you know, Amy, in my lifetime and in yours. But, um, you know, what's, what's real is that we have to, to keep pushing state by state. I think as activists, we can take pride in the fact that campaigns like the Troy Davis campaign really have, have, have forced this country to uh, think about um, uh, you know, what, what we do in the dark, typically at, in a remote prison, in a remote room where we execute people in a, you know, and do something that no other Western country does. All of our peers have banned this. We need to ban it, too. And so, you know, what you're seeing now, right, first we saw public opinion fall after the Too Much Doubt campaign around the, the case of Troy Davis, the man who was actually innocent but was executed nonetheless in Georgia. Um, you know, now you're starting to, to, to see, see that same drop in public opinion have an impact on juries, have an impact on judges. And so, you know, this is what we call an evolving standard of decency. Uh, our country is catching up with its own values, catching up with the values of the rest of the uh, Western world. Um, and that's good news. I think we should all take, take heart that as a country we can continue to evolve. And that's ultimately on these tough criminal justice issues, the, the only thing that can really give us hope. And very quickly, Ben Jealous, before we conclude on another criminal justice issue, here in New York, the state has agreed to overhaul the system of solitary confinement in state prisons following a three-year legal battle by the New York Civil Liberties Union. Could you comment on the significance of that? Look, this is huge, and I think it's hard for most people to understand. We want to believe that the people who get into solitary confinement you know, are just the worst monsters in our society. Um, the reality is much more complex. Oftentimes, these are just people with basic mental uh, problems who uh, find themselves in jail uh, and offend a guard and are put into solitary and in a state like New York could have remained in a six by ten box for years with virtually no uh, you know, mental health care, uh, no treatment, just simply tortured. And that's why it's so important that the ACLU has done what they've done in so many instances and chosen to advocate for people that everybody else would rather not think about or, quite frankly, would rather pretend were something other than what they are. Again, oftentimes in New York State, what was found was that just very mentally ill people who were put into jail or to prison for, you know, very basic crimes ended up in solitary confinement. Uh, as if they were the worst monsters in the world, simply because a guard did not want to deal with this person's mental problems and found it easier to just lock them away in a box for years. And it's a good thing for civilization that the ACLU brought this challenge, that the judge saw the light, and that this practice will be ended. It's actually the New York Civil Liberties Union. And Ben, thanks so much for being with us. Ben Jealous, yes. senior fellow— The ACLU aff affiliate in New York. Right. Senior fellow at the Center yeah. for American Progress. He's the former NAACP president and CEO. Thanks for joining us from Baltimore. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, water, democracy, and Flint, Michigan. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Amy Goodman. I want to thank you for tuning in to Democracy Now! We are so grateful to our fans and followers for being a part of the daily conversation. By choosing a news source that's committed to the truth, you're carrying the message of independent media, reaching hundreds of thousands of people every day. In these times of war and elections, we need a media not sponsored by corporations that profit from war, but a media that's truly independent, funded by you. 
Democracy Now! is not paid for by the weapons manufacturers, the insurance industry or the oil, gas, coal or nuclear companies. We don't take advertising or corporate underwriting dollars. That means we rely on your donations to make our daily independent news hour possible. We need your support today to keep bringing you the hard-hitting, in-depth reporting you've come to expect five days a week. Visit democracynow.org, or you can call 888-999-3877. That's 888-999-3877 to make your holiday gift to Democracy Now! today. Thanks so much for sharing Democracy Now! stories all year long.